Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what we're gonna do is look at drift velocity and we're gonna solve a problem to calculate the drift velocity in a typical copper wire. We're first gonna start with just a quick summary of what drift velocity is and what are the key equations that are going to be used to calculate it. I'm then going to consider the specific application shown here. So I have a current of 20 amps uh, flowing through a typical household wire here that has a certain diameter and a cross-sectional area. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply that to copper, okay? Copper has a density of 8,800 kilograms per meter cube, and the atomic mass of copper is 63.546 grams per mole. How do you calculate the drift velocity? So I'm gonna show you how we can get to these two equations. The first one is straightforward. The current is the rate of change of charge. And the second one is our drift velocity, which is the connection here between what's going on at the microscopic level to the macroscopic level of current. Okay, how are those two quantities connected? All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, to start off, let's consider just the motion of one electron inside this copper wire. And I'm going to assume here that the electric field is set up and it's pointing to the right. Now, if you look at the typical path of an electron, it'll seem rather random. It will undergo multiple collisions here with the positive ions of the copper wire. And guess what? Eventually, it'll make its way all the way to the left-hand side because there's still this electric field here that's forcing it to move to the left. What this means is if I have electrons or negative charges moving to the left, it means we have a positive current moving in the opposite direction. Now, this motion right here, although it's kind of goes through all these successive collisions, overall it appears, right, on average, it looks like the electron is simply going to drift here to the left. Okay, and that is what they call the drift velocity. It's kind of the average velocity of these free electrons that are free to move in the copper, and that's what is referred to as drift velocity. One thing to note is for negative charges like electrons, the drift velocity is in the opposite direction of the electric field. All right, so I'm gonna replace that complicated picture with one electron, and now I'm gonna add several electrons to this diagram. And instead of having um, this uh, case where the electron's uh, going through multiple successive collisions here and drifting to the left, I'm gonna replace it with this simplified picture here of all of these electrons simply moving here to the left. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to introduce this concept of current. And how do we calculate current? Well, we're simply going to cut the wire here. I'm going to introduce this green dashed plane. And I'm going to be introducing um, some variables here. Uh, and I want to know how many charges are actually going to cross this green dashed plane in some amount of time. So again, we have the dimensions of the wire here, which is the cross-sectional area A. And I'm gonna look at a specific uh, distance here, which I'm gonna call delta X. Now our definition of current is simply how many charges flow by this plane per unit time. That's our definition. Now you can write that total charge in terms of what is the total number of charges uh, crossing the plane multiplied by the charge of each individual electron. Um, so that's our second equation up here. Um, the next thing we could do is instead of writing the total number of charges using this uppercase N, I introduce this lowercase N, which is going to be an important parameter, okay? This is referred to as our number of electrons per meter cube. It's the density of free charges in this conductor, okay? Um, that gets multiplied by the charge of each individual electron. So we know that is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And now, since I'm looking at a density, I need to multiply by the volume in order to get the total number of charges. Now, what is the volume that I'm considering? Again, it's a volume of a cylinder. So I'm considering a cross-sectional area A and multiplied by its length, delta x. And that delta x, you can simply write as that value of this drift velocity multiplied by delta t. All right, the next thing you want to do now, well, in some time delta t, all those electrons in this shaded area are going to cross this green plane. So let's go back to our definition here. And what you can do now is substitute. 
So the volume gets substituted by the cross-sectional area multiplied by that delta x, which I've written as vd multiplied by delta t. Now you can see what happens here. We have a delta t in the numerator and in the denominator, so you can cross those out. And now we're left with what? Our equation for the current can now be written in terms of this drift velocity, and look what we get. It's equal to little n, that number density of electrons per meter cubed for copper, multiplied by the area and multiplied by that elementary charge. Uh, if you rearrange this equation, you can get an expression for the drift velocity. So now what our goal is now is to calculate what is this um, electron density here for copper. How do we calculate this guy, okay? Uh, that's what we're going to do on the next slide. All right, so to be able to calculate my drift velocity, I need to know current, area, charge, and also this little n. This little n refers to... What is the number of free electrons, the ones that are able to move when there is an electric field present, per meter cube of copper? So in order to calculate that, you have to look up some data for copper. Um, so this is what you do. Uh, pull up, for example, the uh, properties of each copper atom. Uh, each copper atom has one of these electrons that's far away from the nucleus. So that means that each copper atom inside my volume has one of these free electrons. So the goal is to determine how many of these uh, atoms now do we have per meter cube. So in order to do that, well, you have to look up some other data for uh, copper. For example, we can look up the density of copper. It's approximately uh, 8,800 kilograms per meter cube. And again, the atomic mass you can get from the periodic table. Uh, that's given down here. And that has units of grams per mole. So now what we have to do is do some dimensional analysis and see how we can put all these numbers together in order to calculate this density of free electrons for copper. And this is how it's done, okay? Um, so I write little n, and I know that each copper atom contributes one electron per atom. So I've written the units here, okay? Now, Avogadro's number tells me how many atoms we have in one mole of substance. Okay, so right away you can see that the atoms are going to cancel out here. Um, this atomic mass has units of grams per mole. So again, if my goal is to cancel out these moles, I can then divide through by that atomic mass and the moles are going to cancel out. Uh, at the end, I probably uh, want to convert things into kilograms. So this is what this uh, next bracket is, is to get rid of grams down here and convert things into kilograms. And the last thing you do is you multiply by that density of the material. Now, if you carry this out and look at everything the way things are going to cancel out here, we have atoms and atoms, moles and moles, grams cancel here with grams, kilograms cancel with kilograms, and what are you left with? You're left with electrons over here, and we're going to be left with meters cube, and that's exactly what we wanted here for our uh, density of free electrons. All right, so if you carry out that calculation, put those numbers in your calculator, for copper, you should find little n that's equal to approximately 8.34 times 10 to the 28 electrons per meter cube that are contributing to this current here. All right, we're now in a position now to substitute in all our values to calculate my drift velocity. Uh, this specific example, I considered a current of 20 amps, and so that's I. Uh, what else? The number density I just calculated, 8.34 times 10 to the 28. Now, A is the cross-sectional area for this wire. So the cross-section is simply a circle. You can write it as pi r squared. And I've given you also that the diameter of this wire, if it's considered a 12-gauge wire here uh, using a U.S. system, this corresponds to a diameter of 2.053 millimeters. Uh, so again, you could calculate what this area is here and substitute it inside my equation. Uh, the charge is simply the charge of each electron, which is 1.6 10 to the negative 19. So the next thing we do is you just substitute in all our numbers inside my equation right here, and this is what you get. Um, all right, there we go. Now again, I've written that uh, distance here for the radius. I've written as 10 to the minus 3, and I've divided by 2 because this corresponds to the diameter of the wire, so be a little bit careful with that one. And that's it. Now you plug and chug. You put the numbers in the calculator, and you should get a drift velocity that is this number here, 4.53 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per second. 
Now let's think about this drift velocity for a minute. Uh, if I convert that to millimeters per second, a millimeter is a short distance, right? Now this is 0.453 millimeters per second. Well, that is a very, very small distance right here. Now, if you think about electrical signals in copper wire, they travel very, very fast, right? To the order of the speed of electromagnetic waves, which is like three times 10 to the eight meters per second, right? So we are like several, like so many orders of magnitude, approximately 12 orders of magnitude faster that electrical signals travel rather than those electrons, which are just kind of slowly drifting along this uh, inside this copper wire. All right, folks, that's it for me. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and learned something about drift velocity and how to calculate it for a specific material. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.